That was amazing. Um, once again, my name is Robert Daniels. I'm one of the uh, programmers for Chicago Critics Film Festival, and I'd like to welcome back to the stage Stefan Forbes. Like I said, that was amazing. Um, and what I'm first interested in is one, you know, of course, this film is um, about Harry Schlossberg, right? And then you also have the actual events that are happening within the sporting goods store. Um, and there's a way that that, the, the two, at least the sporting goods store and the commercial chain store, that they can kind of become mm, exploited in a kind of way, but you balance it really well, the two storylines. And I wonder if you could talk about how you balance the two. See, he's not gonna let me off easy here. I can see these questions like, oh my God. Uh, the question of exploitation is really good because in many ways it's a true crime story. And I don't really watch true crime. And true crime is going through a bit of a soul searching right now with people realizing that maybe our criminal justice system has a few issues. But I wanted to, I wanted to break through this notion of Shua Ibrahim and his crew as cop killers, which they've been considered for 50 years. And people, everything you've read about them in the press is like, lock them up, throw away the key. And I sensed when I started making this film that there's a different story there. It was incredibly hard to find them. I haven't told this to anyone. Fresh, hot off the press. When I was making the film, and I tried to find Shua Ibrahim, who committed man's, convicted of manslaughter in 1974, went to prison in New York State. He had died. He, he, he had been released from prison and died. And I stopped looking for him. And I ended up finding Dawood and go, traveling up to Attica. And it was a long process finally talking to Dawood. And he said, well, you know, <laughs> he said, I, I don't like talking. I'm the quiet guy. You should find Shuai. And I went back and looked. And I, I found that he had died. And I, and I emailed Dawood. I actually I just sent him a letter because you can't even email in prison. And I said, I, I have to tell you, I'm sorry. He's dead. And he said, you should keep looking. I haven't heard that he's dead. And, and I, I mean, it was, it was super hard to even find this guy, this cop killer, this evil person who should have been locked up and thrown away the key. Because that's what we're taught, right? That these people are killers and there's nothing that should be saved about them or they have nothing to even tell us. And what I learned through getting to know Shuai is that, and again, this is a hard concept, but I'm just going to try to throw it out there. We're a country born in violence. We need to cope with that. We need to change that. And we need to change this toxic masculinity because it's poisoning our communities and our families and our children and we're, we don't know how to raise sons without trying to dominate them and you know, show them that we have the power and we're actually creating resistance and resentment among our own children in the same way that cops go out and create resentment in the communities they're supposed to police and there's studies out there that they create more violence with the way that they just interact with people. How do, we, how do we solve this? What I learned is that actually, it's people that have been in prison, that have been born into systems of violence, that have perpetrated violence, and have been forced to actually look at it and understand it, and understand manhood and masculinity in America that are actually uniquely suited to be the people to solve this problem. That you had, had restorative justice programs in prison, and he helped so many people, and he's, 
He's working in New York City in the nonprofit community as a very respected voice who is an incredible messenger in all kinds of situations in New York. And he has so much to teach us. That's kind of what I learned in telling the story that, wow, <laughs> everything we were told was wrong. He's probably, most of the evidence points to the fact that he's not a cop killer. And he's actually a person that can help lead America out of the violence problem that we have. And there are so many things like that in the movie that make this, that I learned that were shocking and amazing to me and that I want to share with people and have other people see. And, um, I mean, you know, start very basic though, um, how, what was the genesis, right, of the film and, and where did you start, you know, where did you get the idea for it? He told me he was going to ask that question. And, uh, I have to kind of go deep with this one because it's all about my mom who was incredibly traumatized as a young girl in Poland in the 30s when Russian people came to her village in Poland, kidnapped her and all her neighbors and took her to a work camp near Siberia. And again, the relevance kind of continues, that's what Putin's doing in a lot of the Ukraine, traumatizing an entire generation of people because he thinks that dominating is the way to success in the world, but he's really just creating millions of enemies. The people in Ukraine will hate him for generations. People will be traumatized the way my mom was. So as many of you probably know, trauma is passed down into families and through generations, epigenetically. It's actually in your genes. So I always wondered, like, who are the people that carry the solutions? Who, who, here's my mom, she's traumatized. My dad actually was part of an army unit in the Third Armored that liberated a concentration camp in Germany, and he was traumatized by that. He took photographs that are just shocking and disturbing and for the rest of his life he could never get over this kind of violence and domination so i just always wondered what's the other side of this who who knows how to solve violence who knows who knows the antidote and when i discovered harvey i was like okay i want to know what this guy knows uh, it's too depressing to think about how our country is being torn apart how how war seems inescapable. And if you're thinking about Ukraine, I mean, we just committed, what, $30 billion, and it's like, rah, rah, Halliburton's making money. No, what's the, how do we really solve these problems? And Harvey, to me, was fascinating. I wanted to know what he knows. And you just mentioned uh, generational trauma, and I, my mind just jumped to uh, Alice Butler, who you include in the film. She's, of course, the daughter of one of the hostages. And um, I guess, you know, as I was watching it the first time, I was wondering, oh, this is a very interesting perspective. I wonder why he's including um, her in it. And I guess, you know, if you could go deeper into like, your thought process on, well, one, finding her, and then two, deciding to include her in the film. So I love these 70s movies like French Connection and Dog Day Afternoon. Things that are, I know shown here. Helen, one, two, three, Serpico. These really amazing stories with multicultural, with cultural conflict, but like you usually kind of heard the cops' point of view. And when Gene Hackman is in the, in the bar going, yeah, you pick your feet in Poughkeepsie, huh? Do you know, do you know you saw that bar in this movie, The Oasis? Across the street from where this Austin scene took place was the bar where they filmed that. I wanted to make that kind of 70s, rich, gritty New York story, but in a 2020 way, where we actually hear from the other side, 
we were from different people, different cultures, different communities. And it was amazing to me, like, the levels of conflict in the story. You have four African-American Muslim gunmen. You have a white and Hispanic hostages. Their students surrounded by a thousand really friggin' angry Irish cops with sniper rifles. Like Jerry Riccio says, you hold me hostage. There's about a thousand guys out there holding you hostage. But then, holding the cops hostage is about 3,000 Latinx and mostly Puerto Rican and black community members who fucking hate these cops. So I'm like, oh my God, you know, the richness of that. Can we tell this story, but actually tell it from multicultural perspectives? And we pay a lot of lip service to pluralism in the society. We act as if it's easy to do that. And I realize it is incredibly hard. I have a team of brilliant editors that help me and that I throw cuts out to, and I say, tear this to shreds, what's going on? And sadly, they do, and it's really disturbing, and they're like, your movie sucks, and this is not working. And I realize how hard it actually is to make everyone's voice heard. It's, it's kind of our project in America is to create a society that does that. But if you're trying to construct a national narrative or the narrative of a documentary film, you actually just seem crazy. It doesn't make sense. People just contradict each other. Like, no, that didn't happen. So actually making this work on screen took years and was really hard and it gave me a lot of humility and a lot of sensitivity that to create a national narrative for our country that includes everyone is actually really hard. Um, I think we were talking earlier that you've been working on this for seven years. Um, and of course, um, yeah, earlier we mentioned it being timely, and you could probably point to every one of those years and say it was timely every one of those years. And you were just mentioning kind of how you were changing throughout the process. I'm wondering, was the film, how much was the film changing throughout those seven years? It's actually one of the things that gets me most angry. That while I was cutting this, I mean, I was starting like 20. 14, and I'm like, this film is so timely, like people are dying. And then the next year, I'm like, hey, people are still dying. And every year, people are dying. And we have a solution that goes back to 1973, that saves lives, that makes the NYPD look like thought leaders and geniuses, because they created this, and the FBI stole this, and try to claim it. And when the FBI does a lot of hostage negotiations, you may or may not have noticed, a lot of people end up dead. So they haven't actually learned a lot of Harvey's principles. Through the death of Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, George Floyd, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Harvey's message was still out there. It saved, people estimate 30 to 40,000 lives in Europe. But in America, it's very little known. That every law enforcement officer who carries a gun in America needs this training. There's no other way. And we have a website, holdyourfiredoc.com, that has all the, the, the screenings nationwide that are in theaters, places to look at it, and it has the trailer. Please go there. Please share it with your friends and your community and your email list and people on Twitter. Sign up for our email list on holdyourfirefilm.com. Like, this film is a tool. We're desperately trying to spread the word about this in a very grassroots way because I believe in that. It's shocking to me every year I worked on this movie and tried to figure out a way to tell it, that more people are dying. 
And it's even more painful that yesterday, 10 people are murdered by a white supremacist. And a lot of this film was about me as a white guy going to talk to cops who were going to be honest with me and tell me how they feel. It actually taught me how their emotional trauma and the fact that the only trauma therapist they've ever had in like 40 years with the NYPD is a guy named Jack Daniels, which again is crazy. You know, I can do that because of my skin color. I can have these incredible testimonials from white cops that are shocking at times, but we need you guys to go out there and spread this word and to send it to your elected officials and to actually do something. Because the shocking thing is that there's been a solution for 50 years. And people in Europe listened to Harvey and no one in America did. And you know, to, as you were mentioning the cops, let's talk about the cops of this. I mean, so many shocking. Thing, you know, things that they say that probably, you know, shouldn't be shocking, you know, if, if you watch television, but you hear the candor behind a lot of what they're saying. Um, and the, there's a moment where one of the cops, one of the retired cops, is talking about what effective policing is, which I was taken aback by because, one, the definition of what is effective policing, but um, also how much are they, you know, unpacking their own traumas, as you were saying. And as you were you know, speaking with the cops and kind of going through this, um, did you get the sense, or how much of a sense did you get that they are also aware that policing just isn't effective the way that it's being handled, the way it's been handled the last 100 years, you know? Yeah, great question. They don't love policing any more than we do. Well, to be honest, they probably do love it more than we do. <laughs> but they, they are honest about the problems. They say we're an occupying army. They say we're like the Gestapo. I mean, Al Shepard, who says, you know, some guys just need a beating. And he believes that. But he'll also be nuanced and he'll tell you that community policing is the only thing that works. That was amazing to me because I realized we often see police as a monolithic force because there is the thin blue line and they won't criticize their brother, but they opened up to me about the problems that they feel on the force. And people say to me, you know, I can't say some of this stuff in public, but thank you for making this film. I love this. This needs to be out there. There's this, like, bogus heroism in America, where you can't criticize the military, you can't criticize the Pentagon budget, you can't criticize 500,000 people working in Fort Meade, Maryland, in the NSA, and in the national spying apparatus that's there to spy on us, wasting our tax money on this stuff. There's a notion that patriotism means you can't critique that stuff. And, you know, a lot of cops are libertarians. They don't like this stuff. They don't like in, infringement on our rights. They believe in independent thinking. And they're more than willing to critique government and policing. And they, and they know the system's broken. They know we're wasting billions of dollars on it. It was fascinating listening to an Al Shepard or an Al Baker who says at the end of the movie, there's a different kind of strength. That means we hold our fire and we don't shoot our weapons. Or Al saying, you know, it's a tragedy that America is, is built on violence. And, you know, I want to put these guys out there in their whole humanity, in their nuance. Because oftentimes we put cops in this box where they're just bad or they're evil, but a lot of them don't like the system either, but they don't know how to change it. But it's kind of on us to change it. And um, one last question before we enter, open up to audience questions. By the way, um, there is a mic in the second row to the left of the screen, so kind of conjure up some questions as um, 
uh, uh, Stefano answers this one, but I wanted to bring it back to uh, Raheem and Rahman, right? Um, and I think one of the things I love about this film is how it demystifies Black Muslims. Um, and, you know, um, you talked about boxes, right? And how, you know, Black Muslims have been put in boxes. And I, want, I think I want you more to talk about, like, the importance of kind of unpacking people and specifically especially black muslims as you know as fully humanized people and how that will how that could you know, lead to effective quote unquote effective policing see i i told him to ask me the easy questions <laughs> it just keeps like <laughs> giving me the hard ones but like this is like one of the one of the most nuanced things in the film, because there is a lot of Islamophobia in our country, and there was so much fear of the nation of Islam, and there's fear of Sunni Islam in America. Is you know, as white people, we inherited a lot of fear of black people in general, but when they became Muslim. There's even more fear. And part of the thing that really confuses people is like, who are the black Muslims and who is, what is Sunni Islam? And how can Shuwe be so scared of other people who say they're Muslim? You know, it's super hard to unpack all that stuff, but I think the most important thing to think about is so many times that's been linked with terrorism in our country. We just saw real terrorism in Buffalo. We saw a white dude killing 10 people with the N-word on his assault rifle. But do we call that terrorism? No. And in Fox News yesterday, they said, you know, the killer hated all people. No, he didn't. He hated black people. We are so loath to talk about terrorism when we talk about white people in this country. And, you know, if you really think about the big danger that our country faces, it's really not from Islam right now. It's not. The, Al-Qaeda is a joke. ISIS barely exists. The danger is white terrorism. And we have such a reluctance to name that in our country. We're about to lose our democracy. And just if I can pontificate for one more moment. <laughs> when we really think about it, one of the things that has saved us in election after election, it's the people that we demonize. It's black people who have consistently voted for good legislators, good senators, and good presidents, despite all the misinformation and all the challenges that our country faces. And we worry so much about a multicultural America and who's gonna vote and, and you know, replacement theory. By the way, you know, and critical race theory is like the biggest fear in America. Nobody even knows what the hell it is. But replacement theory is on Fox News every night. And, you know, I, I went to school with uh, Derek Bell's son, Carter. We used to do racism playground in elementary school. Like, Nobody even knows what Derek Bell even taught. It's all a scam. And the terrorism that we really need to face is the same terrorism America has always been victim to for 400 years. And everyone's afraid of what happens if Trump becomes president again, and if we do enter a new kind of American fascism, and there's all this fear that this crazy thing could happen and we could lose our democracy. But if you really think about it, we lost it before in Reconstruction. We've already known what fascism was 
It was empowered racism in America, in the South, that used violence in the polling place, and used violence to destroy democracy. We've already been there. And when it comes back, it's coming back with that same exact playbook. So, you know, it's a long-winded answer about Islam, which in many ways has just been a fake fear. It's never really been a fear. It's a little like the fear of Japan. We all worried about Japan in the 80s. Oh my God, you know, the rising sun of Japan is gonna destroy America. They're gonna buy Rockefeller Center. These are fake fears. And what we really need to do is look at the real fears of violence that are destroying our communities. And thank God we have a question so I can finally <laughs> change, change up here. Thank you for indulging that long answer. Um, so I saw on your IMDb page you've made a previous film that was about Lee Atwater and the Southern Strategy. So that's also taking place in the 70s. And this film was taking place in the 70s. I was wondering how they're connected and how the um, how how you see them as intertwining together, like um, the dog whistle politics of Lee Atwater uh, being the kind of same dog whistle politics that the police are are claiming in the film. So I'd love to hear how those connect for you. There's no easy questions here. <laughs> God. So yeah. I think these films are of a piece in a lot of ways. And first of all, I tried to do a, a kind of multilateral listening project with this. Both of these films are like kind of Harvey Schlossberg-esque in that we just really need to listen to the other side. We need to listen to Lee Atwater, understand what empowered him, understand his political insight and brilliance. And really, and, and, and think, think carefully about why the Atwater was able to reshape America based on race. And anyone here who hasn't seen Boogeyman, I beg you to see it and to share it because I don't think we understand that man's impact. And I know that the Democratic Party doesn't understand that movie and doesn't understand why that rhetoric is still so powerful. So, ultimately, you know, there's a million links based on race, but if we don't give people the sense that we're listening to them, if, if we don't use Harvey Schlossberg's tactics of deep listening, radical empathy, active listening, letting people know that we heard them. This country can never change. And so there's a real link there, and I thank you for bringing that up. And on that note, I think that's all the time we have. <laughs> thank you once again, Stefan Forward Forbes, for uh, sharing this film with us. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.